Bronnie Ware, an Australian nurse who spent several years caring for patients during the last 12 weeks of their lives, routinely asked her patients about any regrets they had or anything they would do differently. Bronnie spoke of the clarity of vision that people would gain at the end of their lives and the common themes that surfaced again and again during these conversations. Eventually, in a book about her experience, she would distinctly identify the top five regrets of the dying. That's the name of the book. Here they are. Number one, I'd wish I'd had the courage to live a life true to myself. Number two, I wish I hadn't worked so much. Number three, I wish I'd had the courage to express my feelings. Number four, I wish I had stayed in touch with my friends. And number five, I wish I had let myself be happier. Funerals inspire me. They always have. There's just something in the reminder of my mortality that compels me to make the most of each day. I've attended several significant funerals particularly meaningful to me, and I can remember the details and the stories well. No doubt you can remember some yourself. But perhaps the most inspirational funeral in my entire life is one I hadn't even attended yet. Years ago, my grandfather, a pastor of over 70 years, called me into his office. I knew it well. He pastored the same church in South Dakota for 53 years, and the items in his office always stayed the same. The large wooden desk, the typewriter, the bookshelves, even the drawer where he hid his candy. I stopped in to visit him every time I was in town. But being specifically requested to meet him in his office on a designated day at a designated time was new. I didn't know why he had invited me, and he wouldn't tell me until I sat down across from him at his large wooden desk. My grandfather started our conversations like this. Joshua, I would like you to read at my funeral. Here's the verse I would like read, and this is where it will take place in the service. As he spoke, he slid a piece of paper across his desk, and it was the order of service he had prepared for his funeral. Over our next several minutes together, he shared with me his hopes and desires for his funeral. I suppose planning out one's funeral isn't necessarily that rare. People do it all the time. My grandfather was in his 90s, and I'm not surprised he would be thinking thoughtfully about that day. Death is inevitable for all of us. But what surprised me about the conversation was not the content or the subject. What surprised me was the confident nature by which he spoke. There was no fear in his demeanor or wavering in his voice. Death did not scare him. He did not regret in any visible way the coming end to his days. And let me tell you, there are few things in life more inspirational than peering into the eyes of a man who does not fear his own death. Years later, I still think about that conversation. Oftentimes, we hear about the regrets of the dying, as outlined in the list earlier, and we're warned to avoid making those mistakes. But rarely are we offered the alternative. Rarely are we provided with an example of a man or woman who faces death with few regrets. When we do, we are wise to follow their example and make the intentional adjustments that will prepare us to face our own mortality with courage and confidence. As I consider the character of my grandfather's life, I can identify numerous reproducible actions that will result in fewer regrets at the end of life. Number one, love people well. My grandfather loved people with a rich love. He loved his kids, his extended family, his friends, even his enemies. His love for my grandma was so great he would speak of it freely even 10 years after her passing. This was not a surface love just for show, but one that included his heart, his mind, and his soul. That's the type of love that allows us to reach the end of our lives with confidence and few regrets. Number two, hold lightly. My grandfather always dreamed bigger dreams for his life than the offerings of this world. He held everything this world offered with an open palm, money, possessions, fame, prestige, he rarely pursued them out of selfish gain. They were given to him at times, and he was quick to redirect the praise when it happened. 
Death always involves letting go of the world. And the sooner we learn how to do it, the sooner we prepare ourselves for that day. Number three, work hard. My grandfather died at the age of 99 and worked 50 hours a week until the week before his funeral, just like he wanted. Nobody has shaped my view of work more than him. In a world that can't wait for Friday and plans exhaustively for early retirement, my grandfather stood steadfast in his appreciation for work and the fulfillment that we can receive from it. When we reach the end of our lives, we ought to be able to look back knowing we offered all of our talents and all of our energy to better the world around us. Not that we foolishly wasted them or allowed opportunity for positive impact to pass us by. Number four, we give freely. My grandparents were some of the most generous people I've ever met, even with their lower middle-class income. And when they were younger, while raising a family with four kids and struggling to make ends meet, they never turned their back on a legitimate request for assistance. From cash to food to housing, my grandparents gave freely. They gave to me, and they gave to strangers they would never see again, all with joy and gratitude. Generosity in life provides opportunity to look back on our days with fewer regrets. And lastly, number five, make peace. My grandfather has made peace with others, peace with death, and peace with God. This is a YouTube channel watched by millions of people from various faith and non-faith backgrounds, and finding peace with death means different things to different people. But my grandfather will credit making peace with God as the single most important decision he ever made. And believe me, nobody faces death confidently without making peace with it first. Seneca once wrote, It is not that we have a short time to live, but that we waste a lot of it. When life is wasted in heedless luxury and spent on no good activity, we are forced at last by death's final constraint to realize that it has passed away before we knew it was passing. Life is long if you know how to use it. May each of us be inspired today to make the most of our one life and live it with no regrets.